obstructive sleep apnea is one of the world's most common sleep disorders, but it often goes undiagnosed. One of the reasons why some people suffer silently is because they believe that there is little more to the condition than simply feeling tired. Every day looks like this. Waking up with a headache and falling asleep at work. Whenever I'm working in the office, I would fall asleep, you know, without knowing, and I was just holding my mouth and I will just fall asleep. And then when I woke up, then I realised, oh, I fell asleep without knowing and then I was so tired because I did not have a proper rest like the night before. Okay, you carry on, okay? I'm not tired, I'm about to take a rest, okay? I'll be sleeping throughout my weekends, like, you know, I'll be knocking off, waking up, knocking off. Even my, when my kids are trying to play with me, I, have, I, doesn't, I do not have the energy to play with them. But feeling lethargic was the least of Andy's problems. Unbeknownst to him, obstructive sleep apnea was not only robbing him of sleep, but also stressing his heart. Patients with obstructive sleep apnea, also known as OSA, will have breathing pauses while they're sleeping. So these breathing pauses can result in either a partial or complete cessation of airflow. It can affect multiple systems in the body. The most commonly uh, cited problems would be those revolving around the cardiometabolic disorders, hypertension or high blood pressure, irregular heart rhythm, uh, heart attacks, strokes, diabetes. Never, never in my knowledge that I had OSA. Never, yeah. Because I didn't even know what is OSA at, at, at the beginning. I only knew that I had some uh, 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 tiredness, you know, from the night because I've got two toddler kids where I need to look after, you know, I've got to put them to bed before I go to bed and things like that. Fortunately for Andy, a recommendation from his doctor led him to seek a diagnosis before the worst effects kicked in. The first step to finding out if someone really has OSA is to take a sleep test. A sleep test is an overnight sleep study. Essentially, uh, it is required to diagnose OSA. The one in the hospital typically will record uh, and measure your airflow through the nose and mouth. It will measure eye movements, measure brain activity via the surface of the scalp, as well as how much breathing effort is ongoing as the patient tries to breathe in and out. If the test shows that the patient has OSA, doctors will give them a list of treatment options. To reduce the cardiovascular risk. And the most common solution is the CPAP, or Continuous Positive Airway Pressure Machine. This is basically a machine that the patient uses during sleep. It delivers a gentle stream of air continuously through a mask that the patient wears over the nose and sometimes mouth. While they're sleeping, the air blows gently into the upper airway and keeps the airway open so that the patient is not experiencing reductions in airflow. It is extremely efficacious, but not everyone is able to tolerate it or willing to use it due to many reasons, which could range from discomfort due to the mask or pressurized air, claustrophobia, or just sheer inconvenience. Andy had a strained relationship with a CPAP machine, but it eventually became indispensable when the device solved all of his sleeping troubles. It's only when I was told that I need to use this, and then when I asked the consultant, says, oh, how long do I need to use this? Oh, you will probably need to use this for the rest of your life. And then I'm like, huh? I got a shock. Why? Why do I? It, it, there's no cure. But I have been on the CPAP myself for about maybe seven months and he has changed tremendously. <laughs> my time with my kids has improved a lot over the weekend because I don't fall asleep anymore. And that's where I get to spend more quality time with my kids. Andy's troubles with OSA may be over, but making sure his airways stay unblocked requires a healthy lifestyle. Regular exercise and a balanced diet prevent fat from forming in the throat and Andy is working out to make sure obstructive sleep apnea doesn't come back. Oh, looking deeper at sleep apnea, we speak to Dr. Ong Tan Hao. She's assistant professor at Singapore General Hospital. Thanks for joining us this evening, Dr. Ong. Hello, I'm pleased to be here. Right. Yeah. Now, we just saw uh, what looks like a, a very happy ending, mm -hmm. a straightforward case of... Mm -hmm a solution that then resolves 
an existing condition that the gentleman has. Okay. Uh, you've seen many patients who may or may not have this exactly as described. Is it always quite so straightforward? I, I think the issue is that um, not all patients present with such classical symptoms. So in patients who, have, who, who present with uh, severe sleep deprivation like this gentleman, they come and they say they're very sleepy, but there are quite a large proportion of patients um, who may not present with such obvious symptoms. So for instance, in women, many women come and say that they actually have insomnia. For, and what they mean is that they can fall asleep, but the sleep is very interrupted. So they wake up very frequently through the night. Or some patients, the problem is that because when you have sleep apnea, um, uh, the airway obstructs and it sets off stress hormones in the body which stimulate the kidneys. So some patients actually present to the urologist, for instance, and they may say that they pee many times at night and it's because of that that they can't sleep. Yeah, so the, the presentation of the illness can be, uh, the presentation of the condition can be quite varied. All right, so in other words, what you do when you get patients is you look at the whole, you, you have to read between the lines. As you say, going out to go to the toilet many times a night may sound like, oh, uh, it's a urinary tract issue. But in fact, it's because maybe you have apnea and then the reflex action kicks in, your brain wakes you up to get you breathing again, and that gets you up. And coincidentally, you also need to go to the toilet. Yes, so, so it requires a fairly, um, the, the doctors who are seeing the patient to be fairly aware that these are possibilities. Yeah. All right. Uh, to be aware about, and this is I'm quoting, I don't pretend to know anything, it's uncommon sleep apnea, but it is widespread. So uncommon is the figures given were 5 to 10% globally. 5 to 10% of the global population presents with obstructive sleep apnea. Well, um, again, it depends on which population of patients you're looking at. I think we had uh, some studies uh, in our local population which looked at people who have self-reported snoring symptoms. And among patients like this, the incidence of sleep apnea can be as high as 30%. So, so I, I wouldn't call it uncommon. It's okay. fairly widespread, yes. So okay. that means of among so, your circle of friends, there would yeah, be a couple. Self-reported, uh, yeah. people self-reporting, and yeah. of that who were then tested, yeah. up to 30% yeah. of them yeah. Uh, were confirmed to have sleep yes, apnea. That's right. And this may be even more common for people of Asian descent. Well, um, so uh, for people who are Asian, specifically um, Chinese, um, there are studies that show that because we have uh, generally a slightly smaller jaw structure and a lot of us may have um, lower jaws that are slightly receding. So the space at the, the back of your throat is actually narrower. So for the same uh, weight, um, same BMI, um, these people may have more severe sleep apnea. So, so the, the common uh, image that many of us have is that patients have to be really obese to have sleep apnea, but not necessarily so in our Asian population. All right. Uh, we just heard uh, earlier in that report uh, that one of my colleagues did, mm -hmm. uh, the possibility of unaddressed sleep apnea creating risks elsewhere. So for example, stroke, heart attack, diabetes, you mentioned and earlier I spoke to you, you mentioned cancer as well, yes. because that's linked to lower intermittent levels, intermittent low levels of oxygen in our blood. Now, uh, when we hear things like that, people mm -hmm. get very frightened. If you could clarify the level of risk and what that's tied to. I see. Um, so... It, it, I think that the data is increasingly clear that for p patients with severe sleep apnea. So um, the way we measure this is in the, in, by an index called the apnea hypopnea index. So how many times your breathing gets interrupted per hour of sleep. Uh, so patients with a high uh, AHI, so more than 30 events uh, per hour, um, and especially those who have um, more significant so drops in your oxygen so levels. More than they need to stop breathing. Um, at least for a sh short while, at least 30 times per hour to yes. count as being in the so, so severe So once, once every two rate. minutes and okay, some of our minute. patients that we see, it's more than once a minute. So it can go up to 60 or even more. Um, so these are patients in whom the oxygen level goes up and down all night. And these are definitely patients 
um, in whom their body is subjected to a very high level of uh, stress. So these are patients that have the problems that you're talking about. So over the next 10 years, they're in the risk of getting a heart attack or a stroke or even of getting cancer um, is quite clearly very much raised. So between 30 to 50% higher than the general population. That's because you yeah. stop breathing once every... Yes, and because not so much because their breathing gets obstructed, but because of the stress responses that are set off by that. But on the other hand, um, you, there are quite a lot of patients who have um, milder uh, interruptions to their sleep and that may not necessarily translate into such an increase in risk. All right, so yeah. uh, thanks for clarifying the level of risk and okay. also I suppose the frequency at this, uh, yeah. at which this might occur both globally and in an Asian, uh, predominantly Asian population. Thanks yes. so much for joining us. Okay. Dr. Ang Ong Than Hao, she's Assistant Professor at uh, Singapore General Hospital. Thanks for coming in this evening. Thank you.